morning. Um, I need to let you know that Bill is not feeling well, and so today we are going to be doing the um, first part of the Eucharistic service, but of course we will not, we will stop before doing the actual communion. So you will use the booklet that you have there, and then we will use a closing Thanksgiving that I'll direct you to um, when we get to that point. So we'll keep Bill in our prayer. We don't know how he's doing exactly. We just know we can't be here today. So our opening hymn is 135. Spirit, 
that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray Psalm 99, divided by the half verse, which is in your bulletin insert. The Lord is king, let the people tremble. He is the throne of the cherubim, let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the holy one. O mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in your Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. 
Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. O Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. For the Lord our God is his holy one. Peter remembers the trip he took to the mountain with James and John, where Jesus was transfigured in their sight. He said that this was not a cleverly devised myth, but what these disciples saw and experienced. A reading from 2 Peter. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we had been eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received honor and glory from God the Father when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my Beloved, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. So we have the prophetic message more fully confirmed. You will do well to be attentive to this as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. First of all, you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, because no prophecy ever came by human will, but men and women moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God.
Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Six days after Peter had acknowledged Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus took with him Peter and James and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them. And from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up and saw no one except Jesus himself alone, as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus offered them, ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Most high and glorious God, bring light to the darkness of our hearts. Give us right faith, certain hope, and perfect charity. Lord, grant us insight and wisdom, so we might always discern your holy and true will. Amen. Amen. Sorry about not wearing the churchy stuff. I had surgery and I've got gobs of junk on me here. So, uh, so th this will have to do, but I do wear a cross. Um, our gospel reading today is a familiar one and really a beautiful one when you think about it. It's figuration means. I mean, you've heard the Bible many times. You heard this reading a million times, but do you know what the word means? So I went, as I often do, to the old Webster, and he said it meant a change in form or a change in appearance, and then he stuck in the word metamorphosis, like a butterfly, and then exalting, glorifying, or spiritual change. Now, of course, the issue is who had the change? Now, Jesus for sure had to change, but what about those with him? What is the two sentences from our reading? One, Jesus came over and touched them. Two, he said, don't be afraid. And three, and these are from the message, by the way. When they opened their eyes, they looked around and saw Jesus, only Jesus, and really it's Sentence three, I'm most interested in. So, do you remember the Moody Blues? You probably don't. You might, but even if you didn't listen to them, maybe your kids did because in 1967 they had a song all over the radio called Nights in White Satin, Never Reaching the End, Letters I've Written, Never Meaning to Send. Well, here's a few lines from a song you may not know so well. Written in 1972 by Justin Haywood, the guitarist in the Moody Blues. And it goes like this. We're living in a land of make-believe and trying not to let it show. Because maybe in that land of make-believe, heartaches can turn into joy. We're breathing in the smoke of high and low. We're taking up a lot of room. Somewhere in that dark and lonely night, our prayer will be heard and make it soon. So what is reality? We think we know, but are we just living in a land of make-believe and trying not to let it show? Even in physical world, physics tell us that nothing, not trees, not rocks, not buildings, not even people like you and me are what we appear to be. Nothing is solid. And I don't understand quantum mechanics. I wish I did, but it's way above my head. In fact, Einstein didn't like it. Even when it began to be proved, he called it spooky action from a distance. But quantum mechanics tells us such crazy things as two atomic particles like photons 
can be, obviously, one atomic particle, like a photon, can be in two places at once. And that boggles my imagination. And I was hoping to find um, Terry or Tom today to explain that to me, but uh, I, don't, I don't get it. So let's go to something down on our level that I think we do get. Things people see are reality. Things like war and peace and racism and the things they achieve. Clearly what many folks take as reality, I hope to God is not so. Now, one reality people believe is that the more they have, the more fulfilled they will be. You know the old line, he who dies with the most toys wins. And a couple years ago, USA Today came out with a list of 20 things people either wanted or were buying. And this list kind of amazed me, but I just picked a few of the top five off the list. And here they are, Apple AirPods Pro, gaming consoles like Nintendo Switch, Xbox, and PS5. I have not the slightest idea what those things are, but I bet you my grandkids can tell you. Number three, I do know what it is. Slippers. And number four, I don't know what it is, but I know Esther has one. It's a Squishmallow. And number five, thanks for Aaron giving it to me, is a Masterclass subscription, which looks quite good. And yet Jesus said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. And I think the King James puts it this way, and I kind of like this better, life does not consist in an abundance of things. Jesus' way was revolutionary. It was counter to the values of his culture and it's counter to the values of ours. Jesus said all kinds of crazy things. Blessed are, what does blessed mean? Happy. That's literal translation, happy. Just listen to some of these things he said. Happy are the poor. Happy are you the mourn. You say, well, that's spiritually. Well, in Matthew it is, go over to Luke. It's happy are the poor. Happy are those who mourn. Happy are the meek. Happy are the merciful. If someone smacks you on the right cheek, turn to him to the left also. If somebody asks you for your coat, give him your shirt. To, if somebody asks you for your coat, give him your shirt to. Why is it so hard for us to see Jesus as he is? A revolutionary figure who sometimes we don't exactly like. And why do we make excuses for him or explain away his words? Could it be that society tells us that true happiness is found in things? I think of Michael Card's song, The Things We'll Be Behind. Every heart needs to be set free from possessions that hold us so tight because freedom's not found in the things that we own, but in the power to do what is right. With Jesus our only possession, and living becomes our delight, and we can't imagine the freedom we find from the things we leave behind. And these can be many things for us. Well, maybe that is the reality. Maybe that is not living in a land of make-believe. They saw him maybe for the first time, or at least they saw him in a new way. For some reason it said, all they saw was Jesus, and then the writer added, only Jesus. Perhaps instead of worldly reality, they saw Jesus' reality. My dream for us as a church and my dream for myself is that we would no longer live in a land of make-believe and try not to let it show. A world passing away. My hope is we can learn to see Jesus, only Jesus. Is that not your hope too? That we see him and we believe everything else will fall into place. And we'll be astonished by the freedom we find from the things we leave behind. I came across a blog one time, I don't remember who wrote it, but it said something like this, and it may not be exactly right, but it's close. Sin is a reality, but Jesus is too. 
And one of the very reasons, or the very reason, God sustained humanity was so that we could witness to God's passionate, committed love for us and live to glorify God. Whereas the Westminster Confession said it back many years ago, written in the 1600s, our chief task is to glorify God and love God forever. So, what then is this reality of Jesus? It is love. And Paul describes it this way. Love is patient, kind, never jealous or envious, never boastful or proud, never haughty or selfish or rude, not demanding its own way, nor touchy or irritable, nor holding grudges, or even noticing when others do us wrong, and never glad about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. I'm glad you're there, because I'm not. I'm a long ways from it. And my hope is that we will see Jesus as the one and only, and realize that his countercultural reality is the real answer for us individually and the only hope for this world. And if we don't do it, friends, who will do it? And so now, how do we put this in action? How do we do it? You now, I believe God is calling us to see Jesus for who Jesus is. And there are at least three ways we can do this. We can read the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because they're the record of Jesus' life. Do I believe everything in them happened just like I said no? Do I think some of it was cooked up by the community? Probably. But do I think they give a vision of who Jesus is? Absolutely. We can meditate on the center of his message, which almost all scholars agree is the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 6, and 7, take it a verse at a time. Don't excuse yourself when you read it. As Philip Yancey wrote, so what's the point? The Sermon on the Mount expresses quite plainly that God views this world with different lenses. And the rest is up to you and him. Church can help, maybe preachers can help, books can help you, but really, it's about friendship with God. It's about relationship. Do you know him? And if you don't know him, what are you going to do to meet him? Now, how would I sum up this whole take on things? And there are many takes on the transfiguration. This is just one. I think to sum it up in a sentence, We began with living in a land of make-believe, so to sum it up in a sentence, I think I put it this way. Look to Jesus, because he knows what is real. Amen. Amen. As you are able, Please stand and join in our affirmation of our faith in God in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, be God not made, by one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. But 
The Prayers of the People can be found on page 6 in the service booklet. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. For Michael, our presiding bishop, Jennifer, our bishop, Bill, our priest in charge, for our companion dioceses, Four in the Sudan and their Bishop Ruben, Brasilia and their Bishop Maurizio, for the people of Haiti and their Bishop Zache, for Eglise Anglicane du Rwanda in our Anglican cycle of prayer, for our diocesan partners, St. John's Crawfordsville, the Reverend Christian Barron, all the baptized and all bishops, priests, and deacons. Lord, in your mercy, guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. For Joe, our president, Eric, our governor, and Thomas, our mayor, Lord, in your mercy, Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. For the homeless, unemployed, or underemployed, Lord, in your mercy, bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. We pray for those who celebrate birthdays or anniversaries this week, including Brandy Titus and Teddy Fada. We give thanks for the altar flowers given today by Mr. and Mrs. Mike Batchley in love and memory of the wedding anniversary of Bev's parents Doug and Helen Frazier, and by Dr. and Mrs. James Alexander in Thanksgiving of their 46th wedding anniversary and Irene's birthday on February 16th. Lord, in your mercy. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. especially those who are hospitalized, including Nancy Neiman, Bev Batchley, and Pam Luck. For those in convalescent centers or at home, Teddy Fada, Sonia Hurley, Candy McPherson, Barbara Moffat, Carol Smalley, Susan Buco, Pat Schroeder, and Nancy Ashley. For those who work to protect us, including the police, firefighters, and emergency personnel of our communities. For our men and women in the armed forces, Audrey McMillan Cole, Chastain Gardner, Jessica Halliday, Brandon Hallowell, Greg, Chaz Hewlett, Micah Jones, Chris Tall, Brian Casper, Amanda Conover McAllister, Melissa Payne, Reed Ratzlaff, Travis Reed, Allison Woodruff, Ethan Loesch, and Zach Webb. Also this morning for Bishop Smalley, President Jimmy Carter, Deacon Larry Courtney, and husband Michael, and Tim Webb. Hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled. And we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, 
in your mercy. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Let us with gladness present the offerings and oblations of our life and labors unto our God.
need you to turn to page 101 for our general thanksgiving from um, morning prayer. It's on page 101. Let us pray. Almighty God, Father of our mercies, we are unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your intentional love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ. For the
tested negative for COVID, so he's hoping to be here for Ash Wednesday.